In the last movie, I asked you to take everything we've learned about migrations and to complete an exercise on your own. Now let's review that assignment and then go over my solution so that you can compare your results with mine and also so we can make sure that your tables match mine before we move on. There were three main things I asked you to do. The first was to generate the models that we would need and by generating those models we get migrations at the same time. And the three models are subject, page, and section. Then we need to actually write those migrations and I gave you some idea of what the columns we would need would be as well as what types each of those columns would be. We also need to make sure that we add foreign keys for the relationship between subjects and pages and pages and sections. And we need to add indexes as well. And I gave you the additional tip that there would be three indexes, none of which would be on the subjects table. And then the last step is to actually run your migrations and make sure that they work. Let me walk you through how I did it now. Follow along and make sure that you have the same results as me because we'll want to make sure that we have the same database to work with when we move on to the next chapter. I'm going to start out in the command line. Notice that I'm in the root of my Rails application. And from here, I would type Rails generate model and then the name of the model that I want to create in camel case, so subject. Right? And I gave you a little hint about that because I went ahead and capitalized them in the slide. And they're singular. So that's the name of the model I want to create. I'm not going to do it because I've already done it. But if you haven't done it or something went wrong, that's the step you would take. And then you would do the same thing for the page and the section. If you need help remembering how to generate a model, you can always just type Rails generate model and you'll actually get a help page that will give you the specifics of how you go about generating a model. Let's take a look at what it actually generated. So it created the models for us. So here we have the model subject, page, and section. Those are just empty class definitions waiting in our models folder. It went ahead and created a few other things down in our test folder down here. We don't need to worry about those right now. And then we have our migrations that it created. So in create subjects, it starts out by just creating an empty create table definition for us. And it's up to us to actually write the columns that we want. So using the slide that I gave you as a guide, we have name, which is a string. We have position, which is an integer. And we have visible, which is a Boolean. So a Boolean is just a true false value. MySQL actually makes that a very small, very tiny integer that it can use to just keep track of 0 or 1, whether it's on or off. And notice that I gave it a default value, default to false, or you could say default to 0. I think it's a good idea to always give your Booleans a default value. So every time you use a Boolean, I recommend that you automatically go ahead and decide, so what should the default be? If I create this and I forget to specify whether it's true or not, what should I have the database do on its own? And then I've got my time stamps, which you should be using universally in all of your tables. The down method just has its drop table subjects, no change needed there. So that takes care of our create subjects. Let's look at create pages. Now in create pages, I start out and the first column I have is my foreign key. That's the relationship between subject and pages. I like to keep all my foreign keys at the top if I can. If I know that it's going to be a foreign key, I go ahead and put it up at the top. You don't have to. There's no reason you have to. It's just a style question. But I went ahead and said, all right, so it's an integer. And it's going to be subject ID. And that's how I'm going to then look up what subject is related to this page. Note that you can also use T references subject instead. We haven't talked about references before. This is new. So I don't expect that you would have done this. But if we say it references the subject, that will do the exact same thing as this. It will insert t.integer subject underscore id. Again, it's largely a style question as to which one you use. And then after that, everything is fairly straightforward. We have name, which is a string. We have permalink, which is a string. We have position, which is an integer. And then we have visible, which is a Boolean. And again, we have a default value for that. Down here, though, after the create table definition, we have our add index method. So we're going to call add index, and it will add an index on the pages table on subject underscore ID. So on our foreign key, it will add in an index. You always want to add indexes on your foreign keys. It's so just a good practice and a good habit to be in. It doesn't happen automatically up here. References doesn't do it automatically. We have to do it here by explicitly stating that we want to add the index. And then I added a second index to it on pages permalink. The idea here is that the permalink is going to be the thing in the URL that's going to allow us to look up the page that the person is trying to go to. We're going to use that permalink to find the page. So because we're going to be using it for lookups frequently, that's a place where indexes really help us out. Indexes help us to find those pages very quickly. And then of course we have drop table down here, which is nothing out of the ordinary. Let's take a look now at create sections. Notice that I'm using references this time 
for the page instead of t integer page ID. We could use either one. Name, position, visible, those are pretty much the same. Content type is a string, and then content is type text. Type text is different from a string in that a text can be almost unlimited in the size that it can be. It can hold a lot of data, whereas a string typically holds 255 characters before we start to have problems. There's some exceptions to that, but just as a general rule, a string will default to 255 characters. Text will be more than 255 characters. That's how you can choose between the two. If you're not sure how many characters 255 is, type it into a word processor and actually take a look so that you have a feel for what a paragraph of about 255 characters looks like. And then, of course, we have a foreign key on page ID because page ID is the foreign key that it determines the relationship between a page and its sections. So let's actually try running these migrations now. We'll come back over here. My database currently is at the alter users migration. So yours may or may not be at the same place depending on where you've left things. That's where mine is right now. That's These three migrations have all been performed and the next three have not. So let's do rake db migrate. There we go. It migrates all of them, shows all the create tables, it shows the add indexes, and now we have the beginnings of our CMS database. You can log into MySQL if you want to take a look at those tables and actually see and make sure that they're good. You could also take a look at the schema.rb file. You'll remember that when it migrates, it also updates this file with the latest database schema. And of course, as I mentioned in the assignment, you should also make sure that you go ahead and do a migrate down and migrate to a couple different versions just to check things out and make sure that you do understand what's happening while you're still getting a feel for it. Once you feel like you understand everything that we've done so far and you have correct table definitions with correct columns in them, you want to go ahead and migrate your database all the way up to the top. Make sure that's where you are as we start the next chapter, which is taking a look at models and looking at how models can interact with our database.